We're enormously grateful to Mayor Emanuel for being a frequent attendee at City Club of Chicago events, encouraging his leadership team, many of whom are here today, to speak here. And <clears throat> as has been often stated up here, both he and his wife, when it comes to civic and charitable events, the answer is always yes, when. No hemming, no hawing, right away they jump right in. And we're enormously grateful. So as a modest token, Your Honor, we have a picture of you when your poll numbers were like 100% at the Jimmy Fallon event. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Your Honor. All right, there we go. All right, have fun up here. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Jay. Is this on? I think that was the last time I heard Hava Nagila, was when I got out of the water. Uh, <clears throat> I wanna thank Jay for that introduction. I wanna thank the City Club for partnering with us to donate all the resources to Becoming a Man, the mentoring program, and I wanna thank him for that. And I want all of you to know, uh, you don't have to stop at your donation of purchasing a table. If you want to give more, it's welcomed. That's my last United Jewish appeal uh, at this moment. <laughs> I want to recognize the members <clears throat> of my cabinet and staff, some of who are here today. Uh, uh, and so if the cabinet and my staff, including the chief of staff, uh, Joe Deal, and Joan Coogan, the deputy, if they could please stand, the members of my cabinet and my staff. <laughs> Look, I've always viewed service and public service as a team effort. And for the last eight years, I've been fortunate to have a world-class team who work tirelessly and incredibly professionally on behalf of the people of the city of Chicago. I'm also proud <clears throat> to note that our administration has more women in senior positions than any other administration in Chicago history. Also, uh, I want to also recognize that they weren't, uh, if the aldermen that are here, could they please rise because they've also been part of an important team uh, that are here. And they helped all of us as partners in helping bring the city back from uh, the brink. I want to thank the members of the city club. By being part of this organization, by coming to these lunches, to hearing from members of my administration and others, and other civic leaders, you are demonstrating your commitment to the city of Chicago and your love for the city. A city can only succeed if its people are informed, engaged, and active in shaping its future. And Chicago is a better and stronger city because of all of your participation in the life of the city. And finally, while I'm saying some thank yous, I'd like to, I'd be remiss if I did not thank my family I want to, uh, I am very fortunate to have two grandparents who emigrated to this country and specifically to this city because they believed in the promise of Chicago. Uh, my grandfather Herman and grandmother Sophie met in Chicago at a dance in Douglas Park in Alderman Scott's uh, ward. Uh, and I never let him forget that he is keeping that ward and keeping that park. Uh, very important to our family. I'm also very fortunate to have two parents that are still alive and at least able to see one of their sons accomplish something. <laughs> Unlike the other two losers in the family. Or as I used to say to my mother, you love Zeke more than you love me. She says, it's not true. I hate you all three equally. <laughs> Explains a lot about the family after that. I'm also incredibly fortunate to have a wonderful wife and a partner who's put up with my mishigas 
You'll all learn Yiddish by the end of this. <laughs> While raising three incredible children. And she's done incredible work, not just for our children, but for the children of the city of Chicago. So I will note, gets the joy of tonight of being able to go to the Chicago Symphony. So she'll have a great evening. Now I want to make one brief moment, point before Craig and I have our conversation. Or as Henry Kissinger used to say, does anybody have any questions for my answers? And we can go from there. He was serious, I'm joking, okay? I don't want to talk about accounting of the last eight years. I do not want to give a detailed assessment of Chicago's fiscal or economic picture and what's happened. I know you know. I have a theory of the case. I, I know you find it shocking, but I'll make that presentation later. But I do want to take a step back and make one broader, singular point. When I walked in the door, yes, Chicago had a fiscal crisis. We had an economic crisis. We had an employment crisis. We had an educational crisis, an amounting crisis around our investments in infrastructure, transportation, our pensions, and neighborhood services. But beyond that, the cumulative effect of all those crises added up to a crisis of confidence. There was a prevailing and pervading sense that somehow the city of Chicago, that our best days were behind us that the ingenuity and the ability to tackle big challenges that had defined this city for generations was part of our past and no longer part of our future. The Chicago Tribune wrote that the crisis, quote, had threatened to sabotage much of the city's future. The schooling of our children, the size of our police force, the willingness of businesses to stay here and grow jobs. I have to be honest, back in the first campaign in 2011, a common refrain I heard at L stops, grocery stores, places of worship, why would you even want this job? In fact, some people in this room said that to me. Why would you want to leave President Obama's side to do this? There was a belief that the tough choices had been delayed and deferred and denied for so long that the cost of each of the challenges across the waterfront had mounted and that each had created their own weight on the city. The result was a cascading effect that the cost of solving each challenge became greater and greater and they were beginning to sap the strength of the city. As the Sun Times noted in their endorsement of my first campaign, Chicago, the crossroads of the nation, is at a crossroads of its own. They said that the city can work along the margins to fix problems. An incremental approach sure to doom the city to second tier status in a decade or two, or can take bold and decisive action of the kind Chicago is known for and continue as a thriving player in the new global economy. They said that the new mayor would need to lead the charge into the city's future. Chicago's always been a great city with big dreams. We believed in what the people of Chicago could do together if we could, courage, if we could muster the courage to give them that chance. Of all the things that have changed for the better over the last eight years, to me, that is one of the most important. Today, we still have debates on how best to accomplish certain things. But there is no longer any doubt that Chicago can rise to the occasion and accomplish big things again. We got our game back. We got the spring in our step. We don't doubt ourselves anymore. And more importantly, we don't doubt the kids of the city of Chicago to set records. We don't doubt that they are doing great things setting national academic standards at Chicago public schools. And we're so fortunate to have Dr. Jackson leading that effort. <clears throat> We don't doubt any longer that our city colleges can be a real ticket to the middle class and a promising career. And we're so fortunate to have Juan Zagato leading that effort. 
We raised the bar for success, and our children across Chicago exceeded our expectations. Now, I promised I was not going to go through our record. But as a father of three children with a lot of nachas in their accomplishments, that's the second Yiddish, I hope you will forgive me for bragging about Chicago's children. In addition, it's my way of sneaking the goods through customs. Record high graduation rates for seven consecutive years, growing at three times the national rate, outpacing 98% of other children across the city, across the country in reading and math gains, and record a college acceptance and attendance. And that, to me, is a true measure of progress. No one doubts our city, and more importantly, no one doubts our children's ability to do big things and take care of business anymore. They come to expect it. And while we can see things like new airport terminals, libraries, Riverwalk, more plainly than we can see the impact of a universal full day pre-K, kindergarten, full day of school, free community college, or the life-altering impact of a mentor. Those are the things, in my view, that will stand the test of time. They will be the most lasting and most impactful in the life of our children and the greatness of our city. So let me be clear, our work is not done. There's no finish line in the race of progress. But the question is, are we better prepared as a city to meet the future than we were eight years ago? Are we in a stronger position as a city to make the most of the decades ahead than we were eight years ago? And I believe because of the hard work of all Chicagoans across this city, day in and day out for eight years, the answer is yes. We stopped deferring, we stopped denying the tough choices. As I said before, denial, it's not a long-term strategy. It's a river in Egypt. <laughs> I knew you guys would get that. Defer, it's said with a Chicago accent. <laughs> Denial. <laughs> Deferring difficult decisions across the board. All right, it wasn't that funny, now get over it. <laughs> around our pensions, around our budget, around our educational goals, was impacting the psyche of the city. It was dragging down our collective capacity to meet our challenges. And that is no longer the case. In my first budget, back when my hair was a tad darker, I said we can't kick the can down the road anymore because we've run out of road. If we can summon the political courage to address our challenges through new thinking and tough choices, I'm convinced we can build a strong future for Chicago's families. Since that time, as you know, we made very tough choices. We stopped kicking the can down the road. We took a different road. And one of the best things of this job is I get to go all over this city. I have had my Walmart walk-ins, my Target town halls, my Mariano meetings, my Jewel Jab Fest. I've talked to folks riding the L, coffee shops, and at different places of worship. Here's a little secret. Chicagoans are not shy sharing with you their opinion. <laughs> I'm in awe of the people of this city, the sense of ownership and responsibility they have in their block, the sense of pride they feel for their neighborhood, the love they have for this city, and the confidence they have for our future. As I said in my last budget address, Chicago now has the confidence to shape our future and not be shaped by it. Eight years ago, Baseball fans weren't the only ones asking, will Chicago get out of its own way and find a way to win? Today, those demons are gone. Chicago is a strong, proud city with big shoulders, big dreams, big heart, and the renewed capacity and confidence to make them our reality. Thank you. Well, I think my mic has just magically come on, so that's good. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity. But <laughs> I want to start with one of the tough ones first. And that's a story that had, had people talking uh, 
a lot this week. It was an analysis by my uh, sometime City Hall colleague, Fran Spielman. Uh, it graded you on your style. Uh, <laughs> bo bottom line, she yeah. gave you an A for basically making the kind of bold, decisive actions that you talked about, mm -hmm. but an F for collaboration, listening to and working with others. You sometimes mm -hmm. joke about your uh, warm, fuzzy personality. Mm -hmm. um, can that be something that trips you up at times? Well, look, you know, I am who I am. Uh, so let me, let me put it this way. You know this, Craig, as I talked about it. When I was uh, on my way, the summer before I was going to college, I nearly died. I was in the hospital for seven weeks, and it was a 96-hour. I was, you know, I was inches away from being on the other side. And I made a pledge to myself, if I ever got out of the hospital bed, I was going to make the most of my life. Uh, it's not, like, it not like the clouds broke open, Beethoven started playing. <laughs> but when you have three roommates who die next to you, and you almost die, it's a life-altering event. Now, Amy's always said that if we had a fourth child, she would name it Patience. <laughs> Fitting with Zachariah, Alana, Leah, and Patience but it would be a daily reminder of that value. Now, <clears throat> let's just take education, because that's where I think I've tried the hardest and probably pushed the hardest, myself, my staff. Now, I believe in Dr. King's clarion call, the urgency of now. Uh, and especially, and Janice and Juan know this, kids don't get a do-over. They either get it right or they don't. Now, when I walked in, Chicago had the shortest school day in the shortest school year in the United States of America. The worst funding of any state in America. The worst graduation of any major city from high school. And the worst graduation from any community college in America. Now, besides leading and listening, you also have to learn. And learning means my predecessor in both the 03 and 07 contract tried to get a full school day and didn't. Tried. So eight years ago this month, I wasn't even mayor. I made a pledge I was going to get the full school day in a full school year. And I changed state law, not even as mayor, to get that done. I didn't wait because I, I didn't want to be a politician that said one thing in the campaign, got elected, and did something else, and went like this. I didn't want to do that. I also got to be honest, all around the campaign, I heard from parents all the time. How come those kids on the north side get full day kindergarten and ours don't? Or the parents that said to me, how come our kids don't get recess and arts, and there's no time in the day and we only have 40 minutes for reading? I heard their voices. I also had the political courage and the will to take those voices to the table. Now, I, I, didn't want, I don't want to go through the accomplishments, but since you asked. Uh, <laughs> uh, but Forgive me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let, let me lean a little forward on the chair here. But did we change the state law so we have a full school day and a full school year? Uh-huh. I make no bones about it. Did we change 60 years of failed funding where the kids of the city of Chicago were the second-class citizens in the state of Illinois? Damn right we did. Did we make sure that every year that the city, the state started to give full-day kindergarten and the funding now for full-day universal, full-day pre-K for every child? Make no bones about it. And because of Janice's leadership and our principals and our teachers and our parents, seven years in a row of record high graduations every year outpacing or over the cumulative seven years, we've outpaced the United States and America by a multiple of three. Our kids also, our kids also, our kids also, our kids also outpace 98% of the other children in America in reading and math games. Now, and our community colleges today, and I don't want to leave that out, are now a model for the country. So what I say to you is, I did lead, I actually listened to what parents had to say. And then, more importantly, 
I then learned for what was tried but not succeeded. Now part of leadership is looking at observing, I want to do one anecdote if I can. When President Obama was looking at health care, unfortunately I had to be sitting right to his left. And he said to me, what did Clinton do that we shouldn't do? I said, and I wrote him a memo, but summarizing it quick. One, don't do a health care plan, do health care principles. So you have the ability to constantly move with your North Stars being fixed, but not how you get there. Number two, get the AMA, the pharmaceutical, the insurance companies, and the hospitals away from opposing you, either neutral on the sidelines or for you. Now fast forward. He had an incredible chief of staff, and today healthcare is universal across America. <laughs> okay? So part of leading is, and I, my predecessor in 2003 tried to get 30 minutes, and in 2007 tried to get 45 minutes. I studied what he did, studied it, and in this time, eight years ago, we made changes so we could actually get it done. Part of leading is listening to the parental voices that didn't have a voice at the table, learning from what did and did not work in the past, and then executing, yes, fearlessly. And here's the one thing I know, as a father of three, kids drop out of college in third grade. And I, I do not believe in the paralysis of analysis. I've been to enough conferences. I made a pledge, our kids deserve a full day and a full year, and they deserve early childhood education. And I am at fault for being impatient. I take it. And I'm happy about that. Because sometimes a political system with a lot of fixed interest needs a little impatience in it. Well, since we're talking about working, working with others, I, mm -hmm. we've seen legislative leaders uh, come to see you but you haven't really been a physical presence in Springfield very much. Uh, did that help or hinder you getting your legislative wish list filled? Well, let's go over it. First, go the, well, first of all, I don't think you have to be there to be felt. I don't. Uh, one is we passed five pension bills over five, over five separate vetoes, all passed in bipartisan majorities. Wasn't present, but we got it done. Number two, we, every mayor has tried to reverse the worst funding of education in the United States of America. We got it done. Third, as I said, I wasn't mayor. We finally got the ability to extend the school day in the school year. You, we, I think we proved by the record we know how to work with the legislators and the leadership. Now. Those are things, whether they're pensions or education, and there are other, a ton of other things we've done that i working both with the speaker, the Senate president, individual members, and Republican leaders. I don't think it's lost. DuPage County Executive Cronin, Dan Cronin's here, and he and I have a very good personal friendship. In fact, his wife likes me more than she likes him sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know I'm not shy. Now the other thing is, we got our business done. But more importantly than that, 80% of my time was with the city council. And I think that's appropriate where I spent, if you looked at distribution of time, I spent a lot of time in DC bringing resources in. You should know that some of my mayoral colleagues used to say they would show up at Ray LaHood's office the body was warm, but the teeth marks were present. And we just took all the money we could. And I make no bones about that either. Uh, so, but that being down there doesn't mean you're gonna be a success. We have great staff, we had good representation. I had a long relationship with uh, John Cullerton, and the President of the Senate, going back to my congressional days. And I've developed a very strong relationship uh, with Speaker Madigan, and proud of it. And I think it's benefited to the city of Chicago. There is no doubt that you have accomplished a lot. People can just look at the cranes in downtown Chicago and see what has been done as far as business is concerned. Does it sting sometimes to hear yourself referred yes. to as? <laughs> you don't even have to ask. Yes, it stings. 
the, yeah. we were going to say mayor. I was going to say mayor one percent. I'll take that on. Go ask Rocky Wirtz what he thinks about being part of the one percent. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he's not where the criticism would come from. It would come from out in oh, the I communities. Know. I think Rocky has a pretty good criticism. Yeah. But it, let me, so let me take on both of them, okay? Or let me address yeah. them on. Look, <laughs> I, I've been in politics in 24, for 24 years with two presidents, Congress, eight years as mayor. I get the politics of playing downtown versus the neighborhood. I get it. It's a rotten governing strategy. You name me one world-class city in the world with a decaying central business district. Name me one. They don't exist. I'm proud that we have a thriving, successful central business district that gives us the revenue to also have fund from 14 to 33,000 kids in summer jobs. Because getting those 33,000 kids a summer job I'm a charming personality, but not that charming. <laughs> and having a thriving business works. Now, let me also say one other thing. You guys will report, I get it, a McDonald's moving in. I understand that. And you'll report, and I'm proud, of both that Riverwalk. I'm also really proud, and I know what the, I think it's th the 300 plus businesses that got $47 million out of the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund. I at least know one of them who's visited Peaches and Sip and Saver and all of them. And I guarantee we don't have a universal hand. But to those businesses, they know what we have done with a thriving business district to make sure that the coffee shops, the restaurants, the theaters in our neighborhoods are. And there are places where you go to a Washington Park, you go to a, uh, and go, take Washington Park. You got a new Peaches restaurant, a whole new train station, excess tennis a block away, New housing by Pastor Barrett with now a new, uh, what's going to be a new uh, nightclub in that area. And Washington Park population is up, their crime is down, their jobs are up, and their graduation rates are up. And so I'm comfortable that there is more to do, but that we actually started to make the success of our downtown become the seed capital for the success of our neighborhoods. And the problem, and let me say one other thing. Yeah, let's be honest, guys. Did the problems on the south and west side start in 2011? No. Alderman Scott? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> they didn't start then. The real question is, did we start to put the resources, take Alderman Scott's word? What's going down now on the Ogden area? The new grocery store, the pharmacy that was there for 50 years and now has the money to finally fix itself up because a McDonald's moved into the city of Chicago. A whole, uh, uh, the fact is that a, a GE finance move to the city became the seed capital to make those investments. And so to me, I understand the politics about neighborhood versus downtown. The question is do we have the policies that bring them together where we have a shared future? And the fairness is there have been days that we've been really good at it and days we haven't really measured up to the goals. That's the honest truth. I want to ask you about ethics reform, because as, as you <laughs> often tell us from day one, you've been taking actions. Uh -huh. The city council has not gone as far as you have asked them, even at this stage. Is the city council really ready for reform? You know, so, all right, well, here it goes. I really wish this wasn't the headline, but I'm going to say this. You know, you guys all. So he, he, let me say this. <laughs> First and foremost, they are. Second of all, it's a cheap trope for you all saying, oh, Chicago's the most corrupt. Really? There's a mayor stepping down today in another city. There's a speaker in another state and a governor in trouble. There's another state with a governor whose chief of staff is in trouble. Come on. Has Chicago got a long way to go? Though you don't pay me to sit here and tell you that. But have we made significant improvements to where we were 20, 30, 40 years ago? Yes. And the honest, if we're honest with ourselves looking in the mirror, we have made big progress. We have a lot of progress still to go. For 30 years, we lived over federal oversight of our hiring. It's over because the city council and my administration worked to make that happen. Every agency has an inspector general. Every inspector general's budget's been secured and raised. 
The fact is we now have a model of procurement that other cities are trying to replicate. Are there other things the city council can do for the city as a whole? Yes, but as I also said, Craig, in past times, making reforms is a 24 seven, seven days a week, 365 day an effort. And it's not, and I wanna then also say this, it is not just about the laws. You can change all the laws so this is right, this is wrong. You also have to have character to know what is right and what is wrong. And you can't pass laws for that. And I think while some people may bring shame on the profession of public service, I think it's the most honorable thing to do. And I think the lion's share, not just of the city council, but members in public service are in it for the right reasons. Do they get tripped up? Do they make mistakes? Do they have, are there individuals with nefarious motives? Yes, but that's not limited to Chicago. Mm -hmm. A quick question about the city colleges. Um, you have greatly expanded on the, uh, mm -hmm. the direction that was started under Mayor Daley about having each college specialize in an industry and having industry partner. But some, including uh, the mayor-elect, are questioning whether that in some ways makes it harder for students on one side of town to participate in a program that's only available on another. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> let me, so let me say a couple things. One of the things, forget all the, I'm gonna get to the details of what we've done. Just to, I wanna bring this back. When I ran in 2011, and this is not a criticism, although it will, of just what I'm about to say. It was about a, a larger, it was a reflection of me, of a larger point. The city colleges was not on the radar screen of the city. And yet for 100,000 people, it was their livelihood. You know how many, in the questionnaires by the Tribune, sometimes and Cranes, in 2011, how many questions did I get on the questionnaire for my endorsement about city colleges? As we would say in Ravenswood, bupkis. Zero. Not, that's not their fault. It was a, the city colleges was blind. It was somebody else's kids. Not our children. Now Amy and I, just on Monday night, we did the courting ceremony for all the kids that graduated from Chicago Star Scholarship, who are now going on to four-year institutions because they got the first two years for free. Those kids now, for the first time, are part of our perspective. We can see them and we can hear them. And I make no bones about standing up for them. And I also make no bones about one other thing. For the first time, Rush Presbyterian is finally hiring out of Malcolm X. That became a healthcare school, as is Northwestern, as is children, as is CVS, as is Walgreens. And I make no bones about the fact that Olive Harvey has a new school in transportation, and North Point is building the largest 4,000 person distribution center a half a block away. That could have gone anywhere. I have no bones that Whole Foods used to be in Indiana, and their distribution center is a half a block from Olive Harvey. And they're adding another 100 jobs in terms of the 250 that used to be in Indiana that has a quote unquote better workers' compensation than we do. That's a harking back to another person who said workers' comp is the most important economic thing. So my, thank you for the therapy. Uh, my point is, though the community colleges were an outgrowth of the McKinsey Brookings study that said we have great institutions of higher learning, they're not really servicing everybody, and that if you can create talent as a draw, companies and businesses will come to the city of Chicago. And my biggest thing is making the city colleges not only relevant to the kids, Accenture, Aon, Fifth Third, Rush Presbyterian, North Point, having never hired, are now hiring people out of city colleges. And more importantly, we figured out a way where parents do not have to go to the poorhouse to send their kids to college. And you should have heard, I mean, if I get started, I'll start crying, this young girl out of El Salvador Amy and I were there, she started crying. Amy kicked me and told me not to cry. <laughs> and I started crying because it hurt when she kicked me. <laughs> Come 
nah, man. You tell me which one of us heard those kids eight years ago, nine years ago. Be honest with ourselves. Which one of us saw the kids at Harold Washington and Malcolm X? They were not part of our mind. It was the kids at DePaul, at UFC, at Northwestern Loyola. The kids at Olive Harvey, at Truman. We didn't count them. How do you get three questionnaires from your three most important publications, not one, on a $600 million, 100,000 person institution? They weren't in our mind's eye. All of us. And now they're relevant. And the Chicago Star Scholarship, the first of its kind in the country, doesn't just pay tuition. It pays books and transportation. Now, and here's what I love about this job, and here's what I love about public life. This June, Amy and I are going to go see Zach graduate. It is every parent's dream. You know it. And Monday night, about 220 parents got to see their kids get a cord and announce Purdue, IIT, UIC, Northern Illinois. We are a great city that finally makes sure our value is every kid counts. And that's different. I want to ask uh, some questions that have been uh, either put in right now or sent in to uh, the, uh, <laughs> the City Club. Uh, this one is from uh, Jane Johnson. She is a City Club member. Um, I am going to quote her. It's okay. You've done a spectacular job with the downtown area of Chicago. Uh, but she asked, do you think anyone or anybody can help the gun violence in this city? Yes. Here's what I want to, uh, so the, the short answer is yes, but it's too complicated a question to give you a one word answer. I think it's, it's clearly obviously, there's a policy piece to it and more than just a policy. So let me say this. <clears throat> there's no doubt that hope replacing despair is a big piece of it. No doubt. And I think like if you look at what we, the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund, if you have a boarded up building and a kid walks by it every day, and then all of a sudden there's a lights on and there's people sitting having coffee at a coffee shop, you've heard me a thousand times, kids cannot be what they cannot see. But the difference between internalizing a boarded building and a coffee shop materially changes a child and a neighborhood's perspective on itself. There's also the importance, and which is why I'm happy about the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund, and also more importantly about BAM and WOW, of giving our kids a restored confidence in the value of themselves. Now let me say one other thing, you should just, you know, facts have weight. 2017, our Chicago police set a record in taking guns off the street. 2018, they set a new record of taking guns off the street, the equivalent of one an hour. We're only into May of 2019. They set a new record on top of two consecutive years of record, averaging today one every 50 minutes. A gun every 50 minutes. Now, somebody that was assigned by President Clinton to do the Brady Bill and assault weapon ban, this is, we have got to figure this out as a country. Now, you know this, Craig, if you gave me what you want, I can drive 20 minutes to Gary, Indiana, and buy you three of them, put them in your trunk, and you can sell all of them out of your trunk. And I can go back the next day and get the same thing. Just give me your order, I'll go get it for you. And this is insane. Now that's the law part of access to gun. Now I want to talk about gun violence. I got to be honest, I do not understand. I mean, I know 
You can get down. You can get desperate. But the idea that you would kill somebody for a street corner that none of you pay mortgage on or own, I don't get it. And I'm going to walk out of here with the riddle to that question unanswered. I do not understand how you could be so low, so desperate, that you can take somebody else's life. And so to me, there's a gun control piece of this. And we have to be honest, there is a moral component to this. And both of them come, and there's an economic. And that's why when I said to you, it's not just one thread that you can pull. Sometimes we want to only just talk about the access to guns. Sometimes we only want to talk about the economics. Sometimes we'll talk a little about the value piece. But we have too many guns and too little values on our street corner. And that's a fact, and we have to deal with it. All pieces, not just some of it. Um, another question. And thank you for the question. <laughs> another question. This one uh, from, uh, I'm, if I'm reading the writing correctly, Dean Egerter, who. Uh, if you can't read it, just make your own yeah, question. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, he is not a City Club member, but it's a good question. In a national political environment where there's a lot to be hopeful for, as you look back on your legacy. No wonder he's not a member. A lot to be hopeful he, for. He said, he said, there's not a lot. Not oh, I thought he said not a lot. lot. Not did, a lot. Did I not hear a lot? There's a not lot. much to be hopeful yeah. for, he said. As, as you look back on your, your legacy as mayor, what have you seen during your term to provide you with hope for this city? Oh, I'm, uh, wait a second. The people of the city of Chicago. It's not even close. I mean, as I, if I wasn't clear there and you couldn't hear it through my voice, the people of the city of Chicago. Now, let me say, since he asked about my book, let me tell you about it. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was the next question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let me, I, I am hopeful. I'm hopeful because of what I said. I really am. We have a restored sense of confidence. We have big challenges, but I think we have now the confidence that we think we can do it. I really want you all to take a step back here. 30 years ago, William Bennett called Chicago the worst public school system in America. And over, not my tenure, but over that 30 years, we have reversed a public institution to being, we have, and we have work ahead of us, but as a national model. We should take pride as a city that we have moved ourselves, take lessons out of it, and apply it to the issue of gun violence or other issues. Don't lose sight of what we just handled collectively. Not a straight A to B line, but through a lot of turning, twisting, et cetera, we've gotten ourselves to a better place. Now, I also say, and let me, this is why one, besides the people, look, <clears throat> I have had the fortune of being in the halls of Congress, in the executive branch of the Oval Office, and the mayor of fifth floor of Chicago. Mayor, take all the other jobs, best job in the world, all three combined, without a doubt. And one of the things I've learned that in a city like Chicago, it is the last political mayors and civic governments are the last institutions that are the most immediate and intimate form of government that people think they can still influence. DC is Disneyland on the Potomac. And you watch it for entertainment. Not because you think what they're doing is going to impact. But here, Janice and I, Saturday opened up. Uh, we, we saw the kids that signed for the new Englewood High School. We had a lot of community meetings and heated discussion about that high school. But more kids now are signing up for that high school and from the neighborhood than before that used to not go to the high schools in the neighborhood, and they're staying. That is how people live their lives. Where's the school? Where's the park? Do I have to travel to another part of the city to go to community college? That is an intimate form of government in the way we go about our lives. And I'm optimistic because we handle big stuff. We're a city that cares and loves our city, 
and we have a passion for it, and we also can show with results the impact of that. And I do think the national government is not just in the United States, but is receding where cities are going forward into playing a bigger, more significant role uh, in that effort and uh, taking on more responsibility on things that 10, 15 years ago you didn't see a mayor do. But not just a mayor, but a city do. That I think is really, really important on immigration policy, on climate change, on education policy. And so to me, I'm optimistic about the future of the city because of the people that care about it and the will now to uh, tackle the problems that we used to not tackle. Um, this, if there haven't been any softball questions up to this point, and I, can, I will guarantee this is one of them, but it's a question that we've gotten a number of, and that is, what, what are your plans for the future, and will you be staying in Chicago? I'm thinking of applying for uh, WBBM radio for a job. <laughs> that would not be bad for our ratings, <laughs> <Yeah>. but... <laughs> I'd be, I'd be a little, uh, I'd be a little worried. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be so down on yourself, Craig. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, so, uh, <clears throat> well, for the uh, first six weeks, uh, I'm take, taking a multiple set of vacations, but Amy and I are going to take some time, uh, and I'm going to bike around Lake Michigan. It's been on my list to do uh, for a while for 24 years, so I'm gonna finally get it done. Uh, the highlight of it will be seeing uh, Zach graduate college. Uh, then we're gonna go, uh, and none of you are invited, so don't come if I see you. <laughs> we're gonna go to the Dolomites up in Italy and go hiking. It's something Amy's really wanted. As you can see, this looks like hiking, uh, but we're gonna go <laughs> hiking. Uh, and then uh, I'll be working uh, in, uh, I got, the book, I've already have the first draft done. I've already edited it. I'm going back on the, with the editor. Uh, so there's the book that's coming out. I'll be writing. I'll be uh, uh, doing some TV. And I'll be doing some stuff uh, in the financial area. I don't know if you know this. Three kids in college is an expensive proposition. <laughs> and so we're going to do, we're going to do it. But I'm, Amy and I are fortunate. And we can obviously not only afford it, but it's a joy. Um, uh, but that's what I'm going to do. And we're staying in the city of Chicago, obviously. Well, I only had one kid in college, so I feel blessed. Uh, but uh, I, I, this one's for me. Uh -huh. Is your wife, Amy, going to have to drag you away from the television or the radio sometimes when things are going crazy downtown? Or nationally, for that matter. No, because both of us are incompetent. We don't know how to turn on the cable. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so we, we yeah, you love this stuff. No, no well, of course I love this stuff. I'm not going to, I'll be, I'm still going to be civically minded and civically engaged. And we're already talking about different things that both of us can do or collectively to stay. But I won't, uh, well, first of all, let me be, let's just be, how I am on, Day one is not going to be how I'm going to be in year one. So I kind of think of it as a recovering uh, person. So as I get farther distance from it, it, it will be less blood pressure and mercury going up in the temperature. But uh, um, I don't think it's about pulling me away. Uh, I care about our city. My tenure as being mayor is over, but my love for the city is not over. And I'm going to continue to be observant of the city that... Uh, not only that I call home, that my grandfather called home, my parents still call home, we raised our kids here, and I care about it. We'll be involved. Will I shut the TV off and go to BBM radio to listen to truth? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get you a bonus or something yeah. like that, okay? Uh, just, just letting us keep working is, yeah, okay. uh, is, is good enough. But, uh, I just like credit. I never called you fake news. Well, this is true. Yeah. I said something under my breath, but I never called you fake news. <laughs> yeah, it was just me personally that yeah. you thought was fake. But uh, um, what, well, you know what, let me ask something that's more positive since we only have a minute. Uh, and that is, what has, do you have things that happen that are funny and not 
always, I mean, besides us asking you questions you don't want to answer, which happened a lot. Well, I, I, <laughs> look, I, here's, let me, I got, two, I got funny, I got sad, I got renewed faith. So one, <clears throat> you know, the building new Chicago signs that are next to CTA stations and mm -hmm. parks and schools where we're building. I, it was one Saturday, I don't know, you would look at the schedule, you thought it was a Friday or something like that. Where I got like 10 events on a, Sabbath doesn't come on the mayor's schedule, let me just say that. So I'm sitting in the back, reading up on what the next event is, making phone calls, reading, you know, whatever. And I realize it's about 10 minutes we haven't moved. So I said, Lou, well, I, I should clean it up. There are cameras. So, Lou, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> and Lou goes, Lou goes, I don't know. Some jerk is building a new Chicago, and we're stuck in it. <laughs> 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 and you know, this, the water department was doing pipe on some major street, and it down, you know, four lanes came down to one lane every other hour. And I'm like, I'm reading, I'm working, I'm getting ready, and we're not moving. I go, Hey, Lou, what's going on? He goes. Some jerk, he also said something else, building a new Chicago and we're stuck in it, okay? Sure. So that was kind of, uh, uh, that's the funny one. <laughs> you didn't ask this, but, um, you know, uh, so I would say both the low and the high, same day, same moment, same time kind of thing. Um, Uh, so, uh, when Hadia Pendleton was killed, I got the police to get the address, and I was in Bronzeville. So I went over to Clate, Kate, Nate, and Cleo's house, and their apartment, on the first floor. And they had a ton of family. I just, you know this, I've, and I did it with like Ms. Bailey and her two sons. And you know, all you got is a hug and uh, love and a shoulder. Here you are, the mayor of Chicago and you feel totally useless, inadequate, and, you know, Nate and Cleo invite you in like a family. They're making sure that you're fed. <coughs> Ask you about your day. You're here to hug them about their daughter. And then, I've, and this is like also Ms. Bailey who lost her son. That she had the twins mm -hmm. under the. Uh, on the way to basketball. And they become, you know, I, I call Ms. Bailey when the trial started to make sure she wasn't alone. She, I said, is there anything I can do? She calls, she says yes. I said, well, what is it? She says, I want you to get me a van. I said, a van? She says, I want to drive our babies to basketball. That's where her sons were going. I don't want anybody to ever hurt our babies. Nate and Cleo asked for something, and they wanted the space so they could help train young men in skills so they don't feel like so desperate that they have to shoot somebody. I don't know if I'd be that Christian in my heart. Obviously, I'm not Christian. But I don't know if I would have the grace to love somebody like that. And by while it's the lowest, it also redeems your sense of the humanity of people. 
and your faith in humanity when sometimes humanity can really constantly disappoint you. And so there are th hundreds of Mama Baileys and Cleo Pendletons out there that I walk out of here if you ask me, they're my heroes. Because I don't think I would have the grace of humanity if somebody or something happened to Alana or Zach or Leia that they shown. And I think they've made me a better person because I've been exposed to their generosity. And so it's been both the lowest moment, and you've seen it, Greg. I don't ever ask you guys to come with me. I do it alone. And Amy and the kids know when I come home from one of these things, everybody scatters. Because I am a horrible, angry man. And then I think about it, and I think about the graciousness of their character. And I'm restored in the sense that the humanity in all of us, if we work towards it. Mayor Emanuel, thank you. Thank you.